having to turn on the microphone. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to be with you. I'm glad to be here. And to, uh, we have a guest preacher, Reverend uh, Rep. Richard Menzel, was here this spring. And he's come down from Gatesville, and I'm grateful to have a week off. And I'm already started working on next week's sermon. <laughs> so we're, we're good. Um, you'll notice we, we've been having speakers come about stewardship. And Mr. Dennis uh, Grundy is supposed to be here from Open Arms Village, but he is not well today. He's, he's ill uh, and couldn't come. So I don't know if we're going to have two speakers next week or what we're going to do. But uh, today's show, service will be shorter since we don't have a stewardship speaker. Uh, you can preach extra long. <laughs> I'm kidding. It is wonderful to welcome Richard here. Um, I'm so glad he's here. You see his bio in the um, bulletin there at the top of the back page. Um, an announcement that's not, two announcements that are not on the, um, um, the bulletin. One of them is we have cookies and fellowship. And I'm excited about that. Um, somebody, I think he was on the worship committee, said we ought to have um, a special event and, and be back and have those uh, cookies and coffee. So we've done that. Thank you, fellowship committee. So stick around after church and we'll have fellowship time together. Also not in the bulletin is that the McKays have a new granddaddy. Um, Grace Jane McKay, born Wednesday afternoon, Seven pounds, seven ounces. Mom and baby are doing great, says Cindy. Cindy's not here today. I guess she's off being grandma. <laughs> and, um, I'm going to be in touch with Mac and Maddie, um, little Grace's parents, and I'll try to visit them this week. But that's good news. Uh, you see lots of other announcements. The adult study that was supposed to start last week on Tuesday mornings, nobody came. <laughs> So clearly I've not publicized it well enough. Um, everywhere is Jerusalem experiencing the holy then and now. It's a good study. We did it in Sunday school this morning. So we're going to do it. And if you like it, Dave gives me the thumbs up. So we'll try it again on Tuesday morning at 11. Love for y'all to be here for that study. Do it again on Thursday night at 6 with child care. That's sort of more geared towards younger families. Um, Thursday evenings at 6. But um, I invite you to that. Uh, Sunday School for the Children's going on, and the youth group is tonight. Uh, trunk or treat. You've seen the sign up about trunk or treat. It is not too late to bring candy for us to share with kids. More importantly, tell the kids in your neighborhood about it. There are some flyers in the back of that table with the green tablecloth where um, Debbie is sitting. We can share those. Take those to some kids in your neighborhood and tell them to come to our trunk or treat. We've got some signs up, and, and I think we've got some signs that you can take and put on your... Do we have some extra signs? Where's Marsha? Do we have extra signs? Uh, no. No, no extra signs. <laughs> we have flyers. Take flyers. Take your flyers. Take your flyers. And Ella, can you... Um, <laughs> I learned, um, you know, Esther Arango Palencia has had um, uh, surgery and now is in uh, chemotherapy. She appreciates your card so much. And I uh, just wanted to pass that on. But she appreciates your card, your love. Um, I think I have said all the announcements I need to say. I'm glad you're here. Welcome to church. I have one. Oh, you do? Please come I don't up. have my glasses on, so I hope my brain works. I hope so too. <laughs> this is a Pastor Appreciation Month, and so the worship committee decided they'd like to honor you today. And so thank you for all you wow. do. Wow. And our <laughs> thank you. you. You all thanked me when I um, was. Um, my ordination, 35th anniversary of my ordination, which, which is nothing, is it, Dick? 35 years. <laughs> Two announcements I forgot. Visitors, we're glad you're here. There are yellow visitors cards in the center of each of these sections of chairs. We'd love for you to know if you're time with us, you can put it in an offering plate as you leave. We take up the offering at the end of the church. And we're still taking up special offerings for the hurricane. So there are little envelopes in the back. We had these in the bulletin last week, 
And if you didn't give last week, you brought a check this week, you've got envelopes. I'm glad you're here. I'm going to shut up. Oh. <laughs> Join me in the call to worship. It's found in the bulletins from Psalm 11. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. In his eyes of the old, his his hand, his the Lord tests the righteous and the wicked, and his soul hates the lover of violence. Among the wicked, A scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. Let's do that singing our first hymn, All People That on Earth Do Dwell. It should be on the screen, and it is in your bulletin. remain standing and prepare your hearts for a confession of sin, a silent confession today, I invite you to quietly pray and confess your sins to God.
Amen. Dear friends, God loves you. He sent his only son to live and to die for our sins. Our God is a forgiving God who loves us very much. Know this. Go forth with confidence and sin no more. Amen. I invite you to um, pass the peace of Christ with one another. Peace be with you. And also with you.
close with prayer. I'll say a line and everybody follow me and you say a line. You ready, Grace? And we're going to say a prayer. Dear God, Dear God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Who stills the storms, stills the storms in, our lives. in our lives. We are grateful. We are grateful. You sent Jesus to us. In his name we pray. In his name we pray. Amen.
I'm sorry to hear that, Alina. I thank you for that update. I, um, we'll, keep, we'll keep praying for him. Let, let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ, you taught us to pray. Guide us by your Holy Spirit that our prayers may serve your will. Show your steadfast love through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray for the world. God, our creator, we pray for the world that you've made. Overthrow evil powers. Right what is wrong. Feed and satisfy those who thirst for justice. Let all your children may freely enjoy your creation and sing your praises. Gracious God, you called us to be the church of Jesus Christ. Keep us one in faith and service breaking bread together, proclaiming the good news to the world, that all may believe you are love, that all may turn to your ways through Jesus our Lord. Eternal God, you sent Jesus to break down the walls of hostility that divide us. Send peace on earth. Put down greed, pride, and anger turn nation against nation and race against race. We pray for peace in the Middle East. For all those fighting with Israel, we pray for your presence and your guidance, for your blanket of love. We pray for peace in Ukraine, battles between Ukraine and Russia. Speed the day when wars will end whole world accepts your rule. For God, we, we cannot love unless we love our neighbors. Remove hate and prejudice from us and from all people. That all your children may be reconciled with those whom we fear or least resent or threaten. Help us all, O Lord, to live together in peace. Mighty God, sovereign over the nations, direct those who make and minister and judge the laws. We pray for the President of the United States, for all of those in authority, our governor, those in the Senate and Congress, for judges. To guided by your wisdom, they may lead us in the way of righteousness through Jesus. Merciful God, you bear the pain of the world. Look with compassion on those who are sick. We pray for church members mentioned and not mentioned. We pray for family members and others. Cheer them by your word and bring healing as a sign of your grace. Lastly, O oh Lord, we comfort those who grieve. Some of us grieve a death that was very recent, others a death that was years ago. But there's a place in our hearts that's missing one we love who has gone. We know that they're with you, O oh Lord, but 
care for us, all of us. We live and love. Lord God, hear all our prayers. Hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the Lord is the end of it, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. starting to say was that uh, as we grow and go through life, we do experience change. We're experiencing change at this time in our lives. You are experiencing change. I'm experiencing change because last time I was here, we were worshiping in a different uh, facility, part of your facility, and that's what I had in mind. And then when I come here today, I discover the facility is different than it was then. But that's a part of life. Life is, in many ways, change. Uh, there are several things I want to call your attention to. Uh, first of all, this, my sermon this morning is different than a sermon I normally preach. It has more history in it uh, and more theology in it in some ways than a number of sermons might have. Uh, the next thing I want to do is ask you how many of you know what October 31st is? <laughs> well, no. Some of you old timers really have a different idea. Reformation Sunday. Reformation Day. October 31st is Reformation Day. 
which is very important to us, and that's what I'm going to be sharing with you this morning now. Uh, also, uh, Walk uh, mentioned that his uh, uh, anniversary of ordination. I was uh, I preached my first sermon in 1964, and I was ordained in 1969. So I've been doing this for a long time. And the other thing I was going to mention, because this goes through the scriptures, uh, what Walk read and what I'll be reading, and it goes through the music we sung today, a strong emphasis on God. Somebody taught me a long time ago that traditions, religious, Christian religious traditions, whatever they happen to be, focus on one person of the Trinity. Some traditions focus on the Holy Spirit. Everything is related to the Holy Spirit. Some traditions focus on Jesus Christ. Everything is related to Jesus Christ. And some traditions, the focus is on God, and that's where Calvin is, and that's where Reformed Presbyterians are, and we've been focusing on that in our music thus far today. So I want to call attention to those things. Now, another thing that I uh, want to say as I begin the reading the scripture, the second reading from uh, the book of Acts, is that that uh, our God, as I said before, was so important, and that's going to come through in the sermon, I hope, and that, that this particular passage of scripture relates to something that happened in John Calvin's life also. So uh, let us think about these things as we now focus on the reading from God's Word. Brothers and sisters, listen to the defense I now make before you. When they heard him addressing them in Hebrew, they became even more quiet. And then he said that he is Paul, at that time Saul, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, educated strictly according to ancestral law, being zealous for God, just as you are today. I persecuted this way up to the point of death by binding both men and women and putting them in prison. As a high priest and the whole council of elders can testify about me. From them I received letters to the brothers in Damascus, and I went there in order to bind those who were there and to bring them back to Jerusalem for punishment. When I was on my way and approaching Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone on me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now those who were with me saw the light, but they did not hear the voice of the one who was speaking to me. I asked, what am I to do, Lord? The Lord said to me, get up and go to Damascus. There you will be told everything that has been assigned to you to do. Since I could not see because of the brightness of the light, those who were with me took my hand and led me to Damascus. A certain Ananias, who was a devout man according to the law and well spoken of by all the Jews living there, came to me and standing beside me, he said, Brother Saul, regain your sight. In that very hour, I regained my sight and saw him. And then he said, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will, to see the righteous one and hear his own voice, for you will be his witness to all the world of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you delay? Get up, be baptized, and have your sins washed away calling on his name. May the Lord have blessing to this reading from God's holy word. Let us pray. O 
Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. I will also note that uh, technology has changed our way of life in a lot of ways. And uh, two or three years ago, I started preaching from an iPad, which I had not done, of course, during the early years of my ministry. And electronic things, as most of you know, don't always work perfectly, and sometimes it's the electronic things themselves, but sometimes it's the person operating them. <laughs> It do make a difference where we come from. Most self-made men and women achieve success because parents or guardians or people trusted totally build up within them certain values and ideas and attitudes that led toward success. Physically, family genes make a difference. They give us our height, sometimes a tendency toward excess weight, our physical attractiveness or homeliness, tendency uh, uh, maybe to uh, uh, have various diseases and ailments affect us later in our lives. If you, this is advice from a Mayo Clinic doctor to one of my parishioners several years ago. He said, if you want to live long with good health, be very, very careful about the parents you choose. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it do make a difference where we come from. People of faith who've lived and died before us in many ways are the lens crafters of our spectacles when it comes to reading and understanding the Bible and the faith. We Protestants are influenced by people like Augustine and Martin Luther and John Calvin, though in our minds we may know almost nothing of them. They may seem to us to be old fogies of the long ago covered with a thick layer of the dust of, dark, of, of dullness. Can you imagine a time, my friends, when their ideas were new? So today we're gonna to spend some time thinking about where we come from, especially from the life and understanding of the number one Presbyterian of all time, John Calvin. Without him, heaven forbid, we might be Lutherans, or Catholics. <laughs> now I say that facetiously knowing there are probably Lutherans or Catholics or former Lutherans or Catholics here. Calvin was a Frenchman. When fathers, chosen, when fathers chose professions for their sons, and that was how it was done, well-to-do fathers, as Calvin's father was, selected careers that would provide a large degree of economic security. So Papa Calvin decided young John should go into the priesthood. Land and income came along with the calling in those days. John breathed his first infant breath in 1509. And like most Catholics, he was baptized very shortly thereafter. In his teen years, uh, Calvin studies hard to become that priest that his father dreamed of. However, social and economic currents are shifting. We live in times when we feel economic and social currents are shifting. Hints of rebellion are appearing in stable religion all over Europe. So dad decides perhaps a priest's future is a bit shaky. 
economic independence far from certain. Dad Calvin changes his mind, and when Dad changes his mind, Son changes his mind as well. The big paying, prestigious career for his son should be law and not religion. And John's course of study veers down an unexpected road. Off to Orleans, young John goes to learn about the law in 1526, or maybe it's 1525, when he's about the age of 17. An interesting sidelight, athletics are big in Orleans in 16th century France. Tennis fascinated students there then. Now earlier at the University of Paris, John Calvin delved deeply into logic, philosophy, thinking about the way we think. He'd always be concerned about making the pieces of the puzzle fit together in some kind of organized whole. And a lot of us in our times have trouble having everything fit together in organized whole. So, his idea was that ideas must build upon one another in some kind of logical pattern. He couldn't tolerate a jumbled mishmash of ideas in the mind. It had to all make sense to him. So law training brings Calvin new important understandings. Law is concerned about words and the way words are used. Law is concerned about relationships between human beings. Law seeks to build up forces in society which strengthen unity to check evil forces which threatened to tear society apart. Calvin completes his work at Orleans at the age of 18 or 19. He's now ready to plow into the glorious career which his father had picked for his promising young son. However, as God does, as God so often does, he has different ideas. So young John Calvin discovers a most unexpected path to follow. No way he can do law. God says to him, you will go for me, and Calvin goes. At the age of 20, he has this encounter with God, that conversion experience, and uh, his life totally changed. Well, Calvin's journey carries him to many places where he exchanges ideas with the dissenters and the rebels of his day. The reformers, we might call them revolutionaries, are his pals. The walls of the old order, the ways are shaking, are teetering, threatening to come crashing down. And John Calvin, along with a number of others, believes that under God, Putting that far behind is a good thing. The conversion experience makes all the difference. John Calvin did not glorify it. He almost never spoke about it. But it changed him. He becomes a new, new young man. He begins to love and revere God as good, as a loving and caring father. Till that encounter with God whose offspring was Jesus Christ, Calvin had been ignorant of the power that ran the universe and ordered human life. And now awakened to truth, he must devote his life to spreading that truth. Well, the king of France doesn't much enjoy such ideas. Wheels of justice in France rotate at the command of the king. And therefore, Calvin decides it's prudent to leave conservative France, his homeland. And so in 1535, now he's about 26 years old, he flees to Switzerland, which is a haven for rebels. And my screen just disappeared, but it's coming back again. <laughs> so his city of choice, where he decided to live, was Basel. He gave Basel a try. One day the next year, Calvin happens to pass through another city, 
the city which is to become the city of Calvin, Geneva. He intends to spend just a single night there. Another hero of the Reformation, William Farrell, a Protestant preacher, tells young Calvin that uh, God is calling him to stay, to preach in this place. Calvin, as always, maybe due to his training in law, can't separate the religious and the secular. He remains in Geneva for about two years during the time creating powerful enemies. He will not accept town officials' willingness to, manip to manipulate church affairs. He speaks his objections bluntly. Result, as you might expect, Calvin and Farrell are kicked out of the city. Three years later, a strange thing happens. Things have changed in Geneva. They invite him back. Calvin has some question about that, and he says to those in authority that uh, if you give me authority to do whatever I want to do in matters of religion and government, then I will come back. No restrictions. And so they invite him back. Laity and clergy in Geneva govern church and community together. All clergy belong to the consistory. Also, and this is new, on the consistory are 12 layman elders elected by civil magistrates from their own number. The group determines what church doctrine and uh, a Christian life should be. The group regulates the morals of the people of Geneva. Uh, we'd have trouble with this part of it, publicly designating individuals as persons whose behavior must change. <laughs> a few years later, when John Knox, great Scottish disciple of John Calvin, visited Geneva, he observed Geneva to be the most perfect school of Christ that ever was in the earth since the days of the apostles. Calvin's ideas on church and community, on the right kind of church government, had much influence as a new form of government known as democracy is emerging. Democracy will replace the old monarchies with their kings and queens. Remember, evangelical faith, faith which emphasized relationship with the living Lord, is new in the 16th century, or at least it has been surviving somewhat undercover. So Calvin emerges as a new interpreter of this understanding of faith. Many Southern Baptists, I, I served a congregation, my last congregation before retirement, serve a congregation just outside Springfield, Missouri. And in that area, there are many Southern Baptists. And I got to know uh, one of the Southern Baptist uh, pastors very well. He was a, a well-educated uh, uh, pastor. And I was surprised to learn, I probably should have known it, and, but I didn't, was surprised to learn that John Calvin is very important for many Southern Baptists. There's one dimension of Southern Baptists that focus on Calvin and Calvin's understanding and another part of the Southern Baptists that go uh, a different direction. John Calvin emerges as a key interpreter of this understanding of the faith. The Institutes of the Christian Religion, which is his most famous work, he began writing when he was about 27 years old. And he revised this work a number of times through the years. This is Calvin's systematic organization of biblical faith. And I've known people within the last uh, one or two years who have opened up those dusty old volumes of Calvin and they have found how those volumes really seem to speak to their faith and to the times in which they are living now. Calvin declares there to be two main purposes in writing 
which will consume his life and which will form the backbone of things Presbyterian and Reformed. One, he wants to explain faith as he understands it and be able to explain that to others. The instance of the Christian religion is first of all, Calvin's own confession, his personal statement of faith <coughs> becomes his most famous work. Calvin declares uh, that there is a second purpose in his writing, and this second purpose is to teach, to guide others in the faith. Those are the purposes. To understand faith, be able to explain it, and be able to teach the faith to others. The Institutes had for their organizing skeleton three tried and true methods of uh, helping people grow in knowledge and understanding of faith. And these uh, Christian education, uh, the, those people who are involved in Christian education would understand how you teach is important, what you teach is important. His three basic things that he taught and a lot of other uh, Christians through the years have focused on the same thing. Understanding of the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, and the Lord's Prayer. So basically, the uh, Institutes of the Christian religion, religion is interpretation of what the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, and the Lord's Prayer are all about. So if you understood those three summaries of Christian teaching, according to Calvin, you had a sound beginning for your faith journey with God. For Calvin, everything, as I said earlier, begins with God. A gracious God called him to take this life journey. A gracious God chose him to be a disciple. A gracious God called him from an obscure village in France to be a proclaimer of the gospel. Such sure beliefs that John Calvin to understand scripture not as a textbook filled with statements about God and about how people should live under that God. A lot of times preachers will say, instead of, Presbyterian preachers will say, instead of let us listen uh, to the word of God, they'll say let us listen for the word of God to us. So rather, as I said, the Bible is a record of God's grace, which Holy Spirit, which the Holy Spirit repeatedly causes to come alive in the Christian reader. In other words, God speaks to us and God speaks to communities of faith as we read the scripture together. It isn't the old message we're hearing, we're hearing a new message in our time. And so the key motto of Presbyterians has always been, Reformed faith has always been reformed, always reforming. We have adapted to a new world, but we're always adapting to a new world. We've, we've adapted to what's gone in our previously in our lives. We continue to adapt to what's going on in our lives as long as we continue to live. Well, there's so much more I could say about John Calvin's thought this morning, yet uh, no, not enough time to say it. What I will do is leave you with three pithy key thoughts from John Calvin. Not uh, much explanation, just think about them. Think about them. You might want to write this down. One, faith is a mixture of experience, emotion, and intellect. It's both. Feeling a relationship with God in Jesus Christ is important. Being able to express intellectually in words which others will understand how sovereign God works with fragile and frail humanity is equally important so that's one just recognize faith is a mixture of feeling and thinking and number two enjoy the sacraments of baptism and communion there's a time when Presbyterians came it was just short, about the time I was coming into the ministry, uh, came to his communion with somberness. And you had to uh, 
uh, the bit come with sort of solemn faces. And that thinking has changed. And I think that cha thinking was changed by Calvin long ago, but we got away from it. And then we have been coming back to it again. The twin sacraments of the church are God's good gifts to the church. Not with somberness are they to be presented and observed, but with smiles of anxiety, uh, with smiles, not with anxiety, but with smiles and with joy. For example, like a truly great meal, pleasing to the taste buds, and people beloved to you, how, just as those are to be enjoyed, communion is to be joy, to enjoy. For after all, it is a feast with the living Christ. I could truly like to enjoy a key win by your favorite athletic team. Yesterday was not a very good day for my athletic team. It's the ones I'm in favor of seem to all lose. So that's number two. Enjoy the, the sacraments of baptism and communion. And number three, work like the devil. In other words, work as hard as you can to live from and spread the word because you love God. Yes, it do make a difference where we come from. Thank you, Dick. I learned some things about John Calvin. And I had to read much of the Institutes when I was in seminary. We studied Calvin. Let's, let's um, say our affirmation of faith, our familiar Apostles' Creed. If you're visiting with us, it's in among the Psalms, the uh, Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose to him from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sat on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's stand and and sing, Arise, Your Light Has Come. into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the blessing of God Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon you and abide with you always. Amen.